there would be pyroclastic flows that would just wipe out buildings, wipe out infrastructure. And then uh, moving a little bit further away from that, you would get a huge amount of ash fall, so that could cause collapsed roofs, it would contaminate the water supplies. Issues, obviously, with aviation um, for some time, potentially because the ash can stay in the atmosphere um, for quite a long time. I'm an associate professor in the geography department in the University of Cambridge, and I'm a fellow of Girton College. Um, I have a PhD in sort of interdisciplinary uh, geography around volcanic risk. I studied English in Cambridge uh, originally, um, I then did a master's in medieval literature, as you do. After that, I, I worked for a while and I studied with the Open University doing some geosciences and some maths. And then I did a master's in geophysical hazards at University College London um, and a PhD in the geography department in Cambridge. So geography allows you to do all kinds of things and put together all those different disciplines. My interest in, is in um, how we use science to um, support and... Um, enhance decision making around volcanic risk, uh, but also how communities live alongside volcanoes. So thinking about how communities perceive risk, but also how they perceive volcanoes, because volcanoes can often be part of the community. They're part of the landscape that's usually very visible um, in many, many different ways. They're part of the history of a place and communities live uh, often um, alongside volcanoes in, in kind of a synergistic way. So there's economic advantages sometimes to living around volcanoes. But in other cases, the poorest people are the people who live at the highest risk. So there's lots of interesting questions at the kind of interface between understanding the, the chemistry and the physics of the volcanoes um, and also understanding the human relationship with the volcanoes over time. We know that the most marginalised people are the people who are worst affected in disasters, whether the disaster happens in the global north, somewhere like New Orleans for, for Hurricane Katrina is a kind of classic example, um, or whether it happens in, in the global south. It's, off, it's the poorest people who have the least capacity to cope, who are least looked after by the state, most easily fall even further into poverty as a result of a disaster. Um, and that is also true around volcanoes um, when an eruption happens. There are different ways of sort of different typologies of what volcanoes look like or how they behave. Um, sometimes we talk about them in relation to the kind of plate boundary that they form at. So um, some volcanoes form at divergent plate boundaries where the two tectonic plates are moving apart. Um, others form where there's a collision between and one plate is, is subducting, we call it, under the other. Um, and then you get some that just happen to form in the middle of plates as a result of the mantle, which is the sort of layer underneath the Earth's crust being anomalously hot. And places like Hawaii form on these sort of hot spots um, that are in the middle of a tectonic plate. There are different characteristics to the volcanoes that form at different uh, plate boundaries, but there's also overlap between the different kinds of volcanoes that form at plate boundaries. So from the sort of morphological point of view, from what they look like, um, you get the kind of classic stratovolcano, the pointy um, mountains like Mount Fuji in Japan, um, which is one of the classic examples. Uh, you also get things called monogenetic fields, so areas where there's a lot of different little cones that come up. Auckland is a very good example um, of a volcanic field where there are just lots of little cones where one eruption happened in each cone, and we don't know necessarily exactly where the next cone is gonna pop up over that area. There's also caldera forming volcanoes like Yellowstone being the most famous of those, uh, which are volcanoes that are dominated by essentially big holes in the ground. There's also a thing called shield volcanoes, which essentially look like an upturned shield. So the Hawaiian volcanoes, for example, they tend to be sort of like little mounds or very, in the case of Hawaii, very, very big mounds, but they're not as steep, that they're, they're shallow. But of course, between all of these things, there is overlap. So there are can be explosive eruptions in Hawaii. There can be very um, lava flow dominated eruptions at stratovolcanoes as well. So volcanoes do, dis, do exhibit a wide range of styles of activity, even within a single volcano. And that's one of the, the challenges in, in terms of sort of saying this is this type of volcano. Um, we can talk about its shape. We can talk about its tectonic comp context. We can often talk about its chemistry, uh, but some volcanoes do vary very, very extensively in the chemistry um, and the chemistry affects the eruption styles as well.
So there's a wide range of volcanic activity. So the mantle under the crust is usually in a sort of solid state, um, give, because that's a, a function of the pressure and temperature conditions that it's at. If it is anomalously hot, though, it can start to melt, particularly towards the shallower depths. Um, and we see on um, seismic tomographic images, which is a sort of like an X-ray of the Earth, we can see areas of melt and, and of, of, of very hot mantle rock that seem to come up from quite deep, some of them, in the, not all of them, but some of them seem to come from very deep in the mantle. And those things seem to be driving the volcanism at hotspot volcanoes. So you get a little bit of melt um, at the base of the crust that is then less dense than the crust above it and can start to ascend. Now, this is going to be quite a basic question. And I think mm. people watching this mm. will probably think the crust is something that stops and just suddenly becomes mantle. Ocean crust is five to 10 kilometers thick. Um, but continental crust can be up to 80 kilometers thick. The, the, the centers of the continents are very, very thick indeed. Um, and so, so there is quite significant difference in the thickness of the crust over the globe. Um, and that just it has to do with the uh, differential densities of the crust. So the more crust gets produced at volcanoes, um, it builds up in thickness um, and it's lighter. It's, it's not as dense as ocean crust. Continental crust is quite buoyant. It's why um, in places like the Andes, um, you get the ocean crust is effectively subducting. It's more dense. It can subduct under the continent. Somewhere like the Himalaya, where you've got continental crust from India crashing into continental crust from Asia, you do not get subduction. There was an ocean there before, so that has subducted, and now two continents are colliding, and that causes mountain building rather than subducted volcanism. So when you said that the uh, on oceans it's generally five kilometres, yeah. for a minute I was quite alarmed. Yeah. But then you, you said that they're actually a lot more denser in those, those places. No, ocean crust is very thin. Yeah. Um, and particularly right at the um, mid-ocean ridges, the, the, the plates are coming apart. So essentially the, the melting there is caused by there being very little pressure from the crust on the mantle. And so it melts because it's got less pressure on it. So you just get new crust. There's almost no thickness to the crust. Yeah. And then it gets thicker as you move away from the vents. So it's very thin, ocean crust. It's, it's more dense, but it's very thin why Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea, the two really big volcanoes on the big island of Hawaii, are often described as the biggest mountains in the world. So they're not as high above sea level as Everest, but if you measure them from the ocean floor, they are bigger. Hawaii is the kind of classical example of Hawaiian volcanism, so which is the sort of lowest magnitude kind of eruption. It produces the pretty photogenic fire fountains that you see on television. Um, and that is essentially where the magma is rising at a vaguely similar rate to the gas that's coming out with it. It's quite fluid magma. It's not very viscous. It's not very sticky. Um, and that means that it, it flows away from the vent quite easily. It doesn't get stuck in the vent and clog it up or anything like that. Um, and those are the basaltic eruptions. They, they are um, low in silica content, high in iron and magnesium. That, that affects the viscosity. That's what's controlling the, the stickiness of the melt is the chemistry. And they're sort of, the Icelanders refer to them as tourist eruptions. Sometimes they, they generate income for the tourist industry in Iceland um, when they're nicely accessible, like the most recent one, um, Fagarásfjall was. Uh, as you start to get sort of more viscous magmas, more gas rich sometimes, if the gas um, has to try to escape from a viscous magma, it becomes more and more difficult. If there's a lot of magma down there that is eruptible, that can be um, erupted because of the, the pressure in the magma chamber, then you start to get bigger magnitudes of eruption. Often a more sort of silicic magma, so magma that start, maybe it will have started as basalt um, in, the, in the lower crust, but it can sit in the crust for a long time and evolve and crystallize. And that means that more of the silicon stays in the melt, the iron and the magnesium go into the crystals. The elements that like to be in the gas phase, so carbon goes to carbon dioxide, water comes out, um, even things like chlorine and fluorine, and then, of course, sulfur dioxide, that kind of famous volcanic gas, they can start to come out of solution and, and form a gas phase, which then increases the volume um, or tries to increase the volume 
of the magma source because that gas takes up more space, that increases the pressure in the magma chamber, um, and eventually the pressure overcomes the weight of the crust above it, the pressure that comes from the crust, um, and that can cause an eruption of a more evolved um, kind of magma. Sometimes you get a fresh magma that comes in the bottom, also increases the pressure, and you get an eruption of a sort of mixed composition. We see quite a lot of that. And you can get a range of, of magnitudes from not much bigger than the Hawaiian ones, um, but a little bit more explosive, uh, right the way up to uh, what we call Plinian eruptions. So Plinian eruptions are named after the AD 79 eruption of Vesuvius, which was described by Pliny the Younger. That is the sort of size of, of eruptions that maybe happen at once every 100 or so years. Um, Pinatubo uh, in the Philippines is a good example of that in 1991. That was a large um, Plinian eruption. And then beyond that, you get sort of ultra Plinian and then you get into the sort of super eruption. Um, so we have two different magnitude scales in volcanology. So I'm going to talk about the volcanic explosivity index because that's the best known. But the VEI scale um, puts super volcano, super eruptions at magnitudes eight, uh, VI eight eruptions. Plinian and sort of ultra Plinian eruptions are sort of the six and seven. Tambora in 1815 was a magnitude seven eruption. There is a relationship between the frequency and the magnitude of eruptions globally. The small Hawaiian pretty fire fountain things, much, much more common than really large eruptions. You can get, um, particularly um, again in subduction zone settings, what we call dome forming eruptions, which is essentially when the, the lava that's coming out is so viscous that it's effectively solid um, or nearly solid when it's erupted. So it just sort of piles up on top of the volcano mm. um, into a big unstable heap of hot rock. Um, and that can be quite dangerous for two reasons. First thing is it can block the vent and you get an explosion or the dome itself can collapse and that causes pyroclastic flows that move very, very quickly down the sides of the volcano are very, very hot um, and very, very deadly um, and very destructive. Dome building eruptions are something that we, we get quite nervous about for those two reasons, even though they can go for long periods of time with relatively little hazard. They suddenly can escalate. And those are the ones we, we worry about, potentially. I mean, we worry about all of them, but <laughs> you never quite know which one's going to go when. So. And it's kind of a futile worry in a way, isn't it, I guess? Yeah, but, I mean, I mean, your job is to to deal, or from what I can gather, is to deal with when something like this happens. How can we best deal with it to protect mm. as many people as possible? But yeah. to actually worry about when an eruption is going to happen, it's almost like worrying about a meteorite or something. We're not going to really is, be able to do anything. It is a bit like that. I mean, we monitor them um, just as we monitor space. So in 2015, I think there was an estimate that we were monitoring about 15 percent of the world's active volcanoes to a reasonable level. There are a lot of countries that cannot really afford to monitor their volcanoes systematically, but don't have the resources to do it. And this is one of the biggest challenges for volcanology, I think, really. Many of the volcanoes that we understand least well are in the least developed countries, um, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, the um, East African rift, rift System, and some of the West African Rift System as well. Some of the Andean volcanoes as well, volcanoes in the Andes, uh, Indonesia. There is a lot of work being done on some of these volcanoes, but it is done in collaboration with um, academic institutions in the global north. Um, and sometimes their research priorities might not be the same, um, might not be feeding into monitoring. Particularly, there are there are um, collaborative monitoring programs on a few volcanoes in the global south, but very very few. There are lots of volcanoes that are just not monitored. Lots of countries that just don't have the capacity to do that, which is entirely rational. If you don't have the capacity to uh, provide health care and education and, and food and so on, you're not going to concentrate on a risk that may not materialise for thousands of years. What is needed is greater collaboration, not just really at the scientific level, but also at the governmental level uh, to, to systematically fund uh, the monitoring of volcanoes because a really big eruption at one of those understudied volcanoes could have significant consequences much more broadly. So, so there's quite a long way to go um, in terms of actually effectively monitoring volcanoes globally. Um, but it's also rational that that's not necessarily a priority for lots and lots of countries. So a supervolcano is a word that was coined by um, the media. It's not a scientific term. And 
it refers to volcanoes that are capable of super eruptions of sort of VEI-8 or very large VEI-7 kinds of eruptions. There's a little bit of, of fluidity between the VEI-7 and VEI-8 and, and how this word is used. Um, but most, well, any volcano that is capable of a super eruption is much, much, much more likely to have a small eruption. So although volcanoes like Yellowstone are clearly capable of very large eruptions that have been termed super eruptions, and so Yellowstone gets referred to as a supervolcano. Um, it also has far more commonly much smaller eruptions. And if uh, we see signs of activity at Yellowstone, the first sort of um, scenario would be a smaller eruption. And uh, Yellowstone is very well monitored, um, and the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory keep a very close eye on it. Um, and and they would be in a position to. to um, provide scenarios and, and so on if they started to see signs of activity. Campi Flegrei is a caldera forming volcano. So it's one of these volcanoes that um, typically forms craters, calderas, uh, rather than having a nice stratovolcano cone that makes it very recognizable to everybody who's a volcano, like Vesuvius. Um, Campi Flegrei is on the other side of the Bay of Naples from Vesuvius. It's very, very close. And the city of Naples is essentially between them and within the caldera of Campi Flegrei. Um, Campi Flegrei has fascinated me for a very long time for a lot of different reasons. Um, it, partly it has a very long history of a very wide range of eruptive styles, um, including at least two very large caldera forming eruptions. Um, so uh, the Campania and Ignin Bright was 39,000 years ago, and then the Neapolitan Yellow Tuff eruption was 15,000 years ago. Um, and there are other eruptions of sort of similar, maybe slightly lower magnitudes as, as well within that time. And then much smaller eruptions like the most recent eruption um, at Monte Nuovo, which was in 1538 and built a little tiny cone. But these cones are scattered around uh, the Bay of Naples area, sort of cones with, with little lakes or, um, or just holes in the ground, essentially set of nested craters. Some of them are under the Bay of Naples as well. The thing that I find really fascinating with Campi Flegrei is the relationship with the uh, Roman archaeological uh, remains in the region where we can see um, evidence of really very significant movement of the crust over short timescales. Um, and we've seen this even within the last sort of 40 years or so. But the kind of classic example um, from Campi Flegrei uh, of this motion concerns the uh, stone pillars at the temple of Serapis in Pozzuoli. And you can see those above sea level now, if you go to Pozzuoli on the, on the Bay of Naples, um, but they have limpet fossils in them a couple of meters up. Um, and that demonstrates that those pillars have been submerged below sea level and then risen back out again since Roman times, which geologically is a very, very short period of time. Um, and you're looking at several meters of subsidence and uplift. There are numerous archeological remains on the bottom of the Bay of Naples that show that there were villas um, there that, have, that are still submerged. So they have, have sunk down. Uh, you can go and snorkel in the Parque Archeological um, in the bay um, and you can scuba dive. I have scuba dived in the park there. And you can see the most of most of the actual statues and so on have been put in the museum to keep them safe and, and they've made replicas for the park. But but there are also old mosaics, original mosaics and so on, on on the floor of the bay. And if you don't dive or snorkel, you can see them in the museum, the original ones in the museum. The activity of that landscape um, is is really fascinating and something that characterizes a lot of caldera volcanoes. We do see a lot of uplift and subsidence uh, crustal deformation in caldera volcanoes. Um, in Campi Flegrei, they have also had significant problems very recently. In the 80s, for example, they had like two meters or so of uplift. Um, well, over, over what amount of time? Uh, about two years, I think. Two meters in two yeah, years? Yeah, um, and they had to evacuate the town of Pozzuoli. Uh, for a while because the ground was so unstable. And what's um, causing this instability? Is it is it a chamber of magma underneath or...? The, the uplift in Campi Flegrei, um, we think, was probably caused in some way by the magma body underneath it, but it may well have been the release of fluids from the magma body, um, very hot fluids that expand very rapidly and cause ground deformation at the surface. Um, it seems likely it was related to the fact that there's a volcano there, but the exact mechanisms of the uplift are still uh, disputed and uncertain. So Campi Flegrei 
um, has obviously had these very large magnitude eruptions in the past and much, much smaller ones. It is currently uh, monitored by the Vesuvius Observatory um, in Naples, along with Vesuvius on the other side of the bay. Um, much more obvious and much more famous in lots of respects, but um, equally probably dangerous, more or less. Campi Flegrei potentially more dangerous, arguable again. The Vesuvius Observatory monitors uh, both of these volcanoes 24-7 and has the best knowledge about them um, in terms of their current state of activity. Uh, both are relatively quiet, but Campi Flegrei has had some... Um, seismic swarms and a bit of ground deformation. We've talked a little bit about that. The sorts of scenarios for future eruptions uh, range hugely in size. The most likely scenario would be another small eruption like the 1538 eruption that builds a small cone. Uh, they think, uh, based on the best science that we have at the moment, that the most likely places for the vent to open up are more um, towards the edge of the bay, so away from the centre of Naples. And again, this is uh, something that science is working quite hard to do, is to try to forecast where things will happen. Because with the volcanoes, it doesn't always erupt out of the same spot. Even Vesuvius, it's capable of erupting over the area of the summit region, whereas uh, Campi Flegrei can, can, has, has vents over quite a wide geographical area. Volcanic eruptions also can last for a range of different durations. They can last for minutes, or they can last for years or decades. Um, and again, that's another big uncertainty with regards to some of these systems. The kind of even a small eruption, a Campi Flegrei, would likely have significant impacts within Naples because Naples is a densely populated urban area. Um, it's on a bay, which makes it more challenging to evacuate people because you've not got sort of 360, 360 like degrees of road. There are plans uh, around, particularly around Vesuvius, but also around Campi Flegrei, um, for evacuation by boat, for evacuation by road as well, um, to particular regions of, of Italy. The, the sort of communes within the city have been paired with regions of Italy that they would evacuate to. And there is current work, I think, being done on, on the, the emergency plans for an eruption at Campi Flegrei, um, assuming that it's... Um, that we get warning time, which we almost certainly would. Most volcanoes, we do get some um, build-up of earthquake activity, deformation activity, gas emissions that can tell us that the, the probability of an eruption has increased. So that gives time to prepare to try to get people out of the immediate area. If there were a super eruption, which is a very unlikely scenario, very, very unlikely scenario, um, then that would impact um, airspace over Europe um, and so it could send ash across to Asia, for example. Some of the company in Ignimbrite is found across parts of, um, uh, of uh, Western Asia and cause really quite significant disruption over quite a large area of Italy uh, from ash fall. Um, ash is quite a nasty substance, and, and even a small eruption can produce a surprising amount of ash. You only need a few centimetres of ash on your roof to collapse it. Um, it's a bit like putting a layer of, of, of sort of cement on top of your roof because it, it's rock. Um, it looks like flour, so it looks very, very fine and dust, um, sort of dusty and, and innocuous. But when you get it, when it builds up, it's really quite nasty. Um, it also gets into electrical systems, gets into water supplies. Um, if it rains a lot, you can get a lot of mud flows. Uh, we see that around a lot of active volcanoes. And some volcanoes, even years after the eruption is finished, you still get mud flows because there's still ash that gets remobilized when there's very heavy rain, so particularly in tropical countries, for example. All of these hazards occur in, in a great many eruptions. In, in a super eruption, they would be magnified. They would go over a larger distance. The other kind of key hazard um, for the immediate area around the volcano would be pyroclastic flows. Um, and those are very hot, rich, uh, ash and rock rich, but, but also gassy flows of um, big boulders and, and they can do huge amounts of damage very quickly. So they can move um, up to sort of 100 kilometers per hour um, away from the volcano. One of the kind of interesting things with, with uh, this kind of eruption, a caldera forming eruption, at a volcano that's not a stratovolcano is we haven't really seen one in scientific times. So we have to infer the processes based on the deposits from previous eruptions. We have seen pyroclastic flows moving down the sides of volcanoes quite a lot. Um, we have seen them much 
less moving over topography that's not as, as inclined, that's, not, that's sort of flatter. So there are still some uncertainties over exactly what the processes are that generate these massive um, ignimbrite deposits. Ignimbrite essentially means pyroclastic flow deposit. And those are the things that sort of characterize some of these eruptions that, that we see these huge ignimbrite deposits. Um, and then we get ash fall all over the place. Um, and we can we can work out that there was a very large volume of rock came out of this eruption. So volcanology is quite a young science in lots of ways. There are still lots of discoveries being made um, because volcanoes have a very wide repertoire of activity um, and some of it they don't show to us very often. So, um, and it's very unlikely that we will see a super eruption in my lifetime, but... Um... Fingers crossed. <laughs> Next eruption scenario, what would be the immediate cause and damage in the vicinity? Um, so in, in the very unlikely event of a super eruption, the most um, the sort of proximal area, the area around the volcano, around Naples, there would be pyroclastic flows that would just wipe out buildings, wipe out infrastructure. And then uh, moving a little bit further away from that, you would get a huge amount of ash falls, so that could cause collapsed roofs, it would contaminate the water supplies, Issues, obviously, with aviation um, for some time, potentially, because the ash can stay in the atmosphere um, for quite a long time, or at least certainly in the sort of, it can go around the globe a few times as well. So you won't just get flight cancellations over Italy or even Europe necessarily. In the 2011-2012 eruption of Pujero Cordon Cauia, for example, in Chile, it was closing airports in New Zealand and Australia because the ash went all the way around the world. Um, and that was a much smaller eruption than we're talking about here. So there would likely be um, significant disruption to global aviation in, in the Northern Hemisphere anyway. So the climate impacts of large magnitude eruptions are still very uncertain. There's been a lot of modeling done. The main factor is the release of, of sulfur dioxide gases that form sulfate aerosols. So it also depends on how sulfur rich the magma is. And that's highly variable as well between volcanoes. What happens when the, the um, volcano erupts is it produces huge amounts of sulfur dioxide. That um, oxidizes to little tiny droplets of sulfuric acid sulfate aerosols we call them they um, can be injected into the stratosphere so the weather happens within the troposphere that's the lowest part of the atmosphere above the troposphere there isn't any rain there's just wind if you get into the stratosphere if you get out of the troposphere and into the stratosphere your little sulfate aerosols don't get rained out as quickly and so they can stay in the stratosphere they can go all the way around the globe pretty quickly the stratospheric winds are quite strong mm. um, and they can stay up there for some time. They will rain out eventually under gravity, but they can stay up there for some years potentially. And again, this is something that's quite uncertain with the sort of really large magnitude eruptions. Um, we don't know if they would uh, come sort of, because there's so many of them, they might sort of accumulate together and fall out a little bit more quickly, or they might stay up there for a very, very long time over a very, very large area. Um, so there's, there are uncertainties in some of the models as well. But that aerosol veil is a very, very effective central blanket. It's much more effective than ash, actually, at keeping sunlight out, because ash doesn't stay in the atmosphere very long. Mm. Ash will fall out very quickly. But, but um, sulfate aerosols can stay up there a long time, and they, just, they essentially... Um, block out the sun very effectively. So you only get very faint sunlight getting through the aerosol veil, which means that underneath the aerosol veil, you get significant cooling in the troposphere. Um, you also actually get heating in the stratosphere where, because the aerosols themselves bounce the sunlight around between them and that can heat up. Um, that can then affect a lot of the temperature gradients within the atmosphere uh, between different latitudes. And so you, you've got a temperature gradient between the stratosphere and the troposphere that's changed, and also often between where the aerosol veil is and where it isn't. And both of those are quite powerful forcing factors um, in terms of, of global climate. Um, the models suggest that you would get significant cooling after a super eruption, um, wherever it happens, but that would be different in different parts of the world. The effects seem are worst within the first sort of couple of years and drop off over the course of a decade or so, according to the models that we have at the moment. Um, but again, we're depending on models. It's a very complex system. So we don't really know, but we think it's actually quite 
short term thing on a geological, certainly on a geological timescale, but even really on a climatological timescale, it's quite short. But in terms of, of, of failed harvests, feeding people, global supply chains, electrical systems, all of those sorts of things, they have, they're much more fragile. Um, if you have 10 years of, of temperatures being significantly cooler so you can't grow the things you normally grow, you have to adapt very, very quickly. Um, and you will have people who can't be fed. So, um, so the potential impacts are very substantial for humanity. I mean, ash is, as I've said, really very annoying. Um, <laughs> and you, you discover that very quickly if you work on volcanoes, because even volcanoes that aren't producing that much ash, you take a laptop near them for any length of time, which we do when we attach it to a spectrometer or whatever. Um, it gets full of ash very, very quickly, and it does not like being full of ash. Uh, we have seen this also in, in eruptions um, in Latin America, for example, where um, electricity grids don't work very well, cars don't work very well if you get ash in the engine, um, just like airplanes don't. So <laughs> there are a lot of um, problems when you mix machinery with, with volcanic ash. Uh, with some eruptions that have been um, incidents of fluorosis, for example, fluorine poisoning from volcanic eruptions, particularly that is when ash gets into the water supply and contaminates the water supply. Um, hist long history of that in Iceland, but also in the Nabra eruption in 2011, in, um, which was right on the border between Eritrea and Ethiopia, uh, there were reports of, of fluorosis from that eruption. Um, the challenge to livestock and, and even to pets, actually, um, increasingly, we, we're seeing people wanting to take their pets with them when they evacuate, uh, because, uh, or worrying about their pets. Even so, in Eyjafjallajökull, for, for example, in 2010, the Iceland, a lot of Icelanders were worried about their pets because they only have small lungs. Uh, but livestock is a huge problem um, because uh, they can't eat the grass that's been contaminated. It's very difficult to evacuate livestock. Farmers typically won't evacuate or don't want to evacuate without their livestock. So increasingly, countries are trying to take that into account and trying to have plans in place to evacuate livestock as well as people, um, and indeed to evacuate pets as well as people. Um, not just in volcanic eruptions, actually, with, with uh, particularly the, the pet issue, um, hurricanes and things like that, there's been issues with people not evacuating because of their pets. And there have been some really tragic incidents in the last sort of 20 years of, of farmers losing large amounts of of um, cattle and, and other livestock as a result of volcanic eruptions and then needing compensation. But also there's an emotional toll to that because they do have an emotional attachment to their animals. How about we do this? This is sensational. This is red top sun okay. newspaper stuff okay, here. Okay. On. Likelihood of an eruption in our lifetime. I'm not, I wouldn't put a number on, on something like a large, you mean a large magnitude eruption? Yeah. The most recent estimates of the return periods of a magnitude eight eruption at any volcano in the world. So not, not just talking about Campi Flegre, but talking about any of the sort of volcanoes that are capable of magnitude eight, it, that is that they happen probably about every 15,000 years. It ranges from sort of 14,000 down to sort of 20,000, uh, but there's uncertainties on that. So um, it's, it's a very low probability of it happening. Um, in, in any of our lifetimes, so 0.01% or something like that, I think, for any given year. or It is very, very low. It, it's, it's much more likely that, that we would have some sort of large magnitude but not super eruption level kind of an eruption somewhere, but we, we don't know where. And those, those are every sort of 600 to 1,000 years or 600 to 1,200 years, depending on who you ask. And again, there's a lot of uncertainty on these things, particularly for the VI-8s, because the record there are so few of them in the geological record. We don't think we found all of them, even for the last like two million years, which is the geological last five minutes. Um, using statistical models, some colleagues at Bristol estimated that the return period is about seventeen thousand years, but plus or minus five thousand years. For, no, no method is foolproof for figuring out the return periods of these things. Um, and prior to about twenty eighteen. It was thought to be much longer term periods for, for these things. So we're still very uncertain because we don't have enough data. There are still a lot of volcanoes we barely know the eruptive histories of. Um, it's very hard to estimate the size of the deposits sometimes, especially if it was a very long time ago and the deposits have eroded. Um, and we define a super eruption as producing certain volumes. So 
now that you know all that and you've done all this, this is your life's work effectively, mm. or it's your <laughs> specialism, your profession. Mm -hmm. If someone offered you a gorgeous villa in the middle of Naples, would you accept it? <sighs> With a lovely swimming pool and a view over the bay. I'd be tempted, to be honest. When I did my PhD research on Montserrat, people would tell me, well, they said to us the volcano might erupt, and I said, yeah, it might, but not in my lifetime. And the probability of any single volcano erupting within your lifetime is often very, very small, even for a smaller eruption, let alone a very large eruption. Next 40 years or whatever, the chances of this, of a, of a large eruption at Campi Flegre are really, really tiny. I do think that having a very highly populated area like that between two really massive volcanoes is not great. And so I'm not sure it would actually be responsible to move to Naples and increase the population that's at risk. One of the challenges for the municipality in Naples, I think, is reducing population rather than allowing it to continue to increase because that is problematic for, for many, many reasons, some of which are not related to volcanism, but also because there is volcanic risk there. And, a, and the more you keep building and keep building, eventually the thing will erupt. So even if it's a small eruption, the more densely populated the area is, the more problematic a small eruption is going to be. So, yeah, um, I would rather go on the Amalfi Coast somewhere a little bit further away, you know, further south. <laughs> Hello, I'm David McMillan. I was a smuggler for nearly 40 years, and that involved prison, which I took on the chin mostly, but sometimes it just doesn't work out. Bangkok was one of those. Execution, or near enough to it, two weeks away, and that meant when it comes to prison,